Welcome to the Denison Forum podcast. I'm Dr. Mark Terman, Executive Director of Denison Forum and host for today's conversation. Thank you for being a part of this, and we hope that it's useful to you. Today, we're having another conversation with our friend Curtis Chang. Let me remind you of who Curtis is. He lives on the West Coast. He is a theologian and a consulting faculty member at Duke Divinity School, as well as being a senior fellow with the Fuller Theological Seminary. He has written extensively for New York Times, Christianity Today, and has appeared on CNN, CBS, ABC, NBC, PBS, and NPR's All Things Considered. He is also the host of a podcast that you may have heard of or or gotten to listen to called Good Faith uh, with his co-host, David French, and others who appear on his podcast who are very, very insightful thought leaders and faith leaders in our culture today. And we welcome Curtis back to our conversation. Uh, Conversations here at the Denison Forum podcast that we hope are culturally relevant and faith inspiring. We want to help you to understand the culture and to be equipped so that you as a follower of Christ can be a redeeming influence in our culture. And as our founder and cultural theologian, Dr. Jim Dennison likes to say, if God couldn't use us in this time and place, we wouldn't be alive in this time and place. So be encouraged by that. And we hope that this conversation with Curtis Chang around his recent book, The Anxiety Opportunity, How Worry is the Doorway to Your Best Self, and I would say Your Best Influence for the Kingdom of Christ. That's our conversation today. Welcome, Curtis, to the Denison Forum, or welcome back, I should say, to the Denison Forum podcast. Curtis, uh, welcome back to the Denison Forum podcast, and congratulations that the book is finally in release form. So uh, tell us how you're feeling at this point about uh, the new book, The Anxiety Opportunity. Uh, should I say I'm feeling anxious? Uh, would that be appropriate? <laughs> that would be appropriate. <laughs> um, we'll make there you is a, a level. Yeah, we'll make you a, 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 an example, a, a real life example today. There you go. Um, I am feeling a little anxious because you do put in all of this work and time. And it's just, you know, I don't think people, unless you've gone through it, you don't realize how much work and time goes into birthing a book into the world. And because anxiety is the fear of some future loss, that's what anxiety is. Right. Um, I would be, I think, not fully human if I felt like zero anxiety, that all that work will not produce uh, the desired result or will be lost uh, in terms of you know lost attention, people not uh, giving the book a chance and so forth. So yeah, I have to confess, I am feeling a little anxiety as the book goes out in the world. So help people that may not be as familiar with uh, you and your work as I am, frame it a little bit. Uh, of all the titles that we might put in front of your name in terms of minister, speaker, professor, uh, even journalist, podcaster, uh, author, where does author fall into that list? Uh, if, if somebody said, hey, Curtis, you're an author, is that something yeah. that resonates with you immediately or do you consider yourself well, yeah, I have written a book or a few books, but um, that's not the the first thing I would say about myself. How do you frame that? No, that's a great question. I think um, right now, I think a lot of people know me as a podcast host of the Good Faith Podcast. That's probably where I think most people have heard of me or appearing on podcasts like this this great podcast of yours. Um, and uh, and that's been great because I the Good Faith Podcast has built such a a strong community of people that are gathered around to try to make sense of the world together. And I I love having being being able to do that with guests like my regular guest, David French and others. So probably that's how I'm most known for, but I have written uh, a few books before written one book on uh, apologetics before called engaging unbelief. But I think this book is going to be probably the one that has the most potential anyways for widespread relevance, just because the topic uh, is so relevant to people these days with with how widespread of an anxiety we have. Um, but Mark, there is one part of my title that uh, probably explains why I wrote the book, which is that I think you can call me former pastor. So I okay. used to be the lead pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California. And the reason why that former is there in that title explains why I wrote this book. Mm-hmm. Because as I write, as I describe in the book, I am somebody who has suffered anxiety firsthand. I'm not writing about this as somebody who is outside the experience, but I've suffered it most of my life and have had really 
a couple of at least, um, and one particular catastrophic experience of anxiety. And that happened when I was a, when I took over as the lead pastor of a church under a very stressful situation. And uh, eventually that anxiety kept building up within me, although it was unnamed and unrecognized at the time as anxiety, it was building up to me. And for me, where it shows up is in my sleep. And so I uh, eventually was getting into this period where I was starting to sleep less and less, you know, five hours and four hours and good if I was getting three. And then I finally went through a two week period, Mark, where I did not consciously fall asleep at all for two wow. weeks straight. Wow. And I remember in the middle of that two weeks period, uh, I, I screamed at God in prayer, just make it stop, just make it stop. And I suddenly had this moment of realization, it's like, oh, this is how Guantanamo Bay works. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean, this feels like torture. I mean, but right. it's not just you're tired when you, when you are, have this sort of two-week period of anxiety-driven insomnia. It is psychic torture. Uh, and this is why sleep deprivation is used, uh, unfortunately, as a form of torture in parts of the world. Right. And, um, and so it was just a, it was an awful, awful experience. It destroyed my pastoral career. It sent me into a very dark place for a, a, you know, a good number of, of, uh, of time there. And so I am writing about anxiety as somebody who has suffered it. And yet, Mark, the message, the title of the book, uh, as you announced, is called The Anxiety Opportunity, How Worry is the Doorway to Your Best Self. And I wrote, that, I wrote this book because I can testify to the truth of that, that anxiety, while it does cause suffering, while there are absolutely problematic aspects of it, Ultimately, as followers of Jesus, we are invited to enter into anxiety as an opportunity for spiritual growth, that it is the doorway to our best self. And that invitation is why I wrote the book and, the, and the realizing that I wasn't taught that, that I, wasn't, I hadn't recognized that and seen the biblical basis for that understanding of anxiety. That was actually what got me into trouble as a pastor. That the the fact that I was treating anxiety as just a problem um, to either ignore or push away. That's actually what caused, in many ways, that breakdown. And so I wrote this book because to try to save others from making the same mistake I made of treating anxiety as something to just push away or make go away solely as a problem, and invite people to en- engage with what I've also experienced which is that anxiety is the one of the most powerful opportunities that God gives us for spiritual growth. Well, that's a, a great way of framing it. Sounds sounds like it's uh, in many ways parallel to what we see in the Bible about trials more broadly. Uh, and, and as I hear you talk about that, it, it's, it's, and I, I saw it as I read through the book as well, is that anxiety is, uh, is just a part of life, as trials are simply a part of a life right. in in a broken world like ours. And um, we can get in, and I want to get into the conversation about the definition that you give of anxiety as a, a fear of future loss and our sense of avoidance about it. And that in many ways, in some ways, we're drawn to Christ, we're drawn to faith in Christ uh, as an avoidance strategy, right? Um, yeah. not as an overcoming strategy, but more as an avoidance strategy. Um, but but it, it, it's, I, I love the way you frame that and the, the fact that it's an invitation, but it helps us to start down a conversation of realizing that anxiety is par for the course. It is simply a fact of life. Uh, let's go back a little bit to your story about when you were a pastor. Give us a, a sense of the, of the frame, the time frame of that buildup from when you stepped in as a pastor to this time where, you know, and like I said, I, I love the vulnerability of, hey, I've, I not only have suffered anxiety, it's cost me a lot. It, yeah. it, and it not only yeah. cost me personal pain, but it cost me a, a professional reality in terms of yeah. a ministry career. Um, uh, and, and so there's a lot of credibility, obviously, that comes with that instead of speaking from, to this from a theoretical standpoint. Um, but give us a sense of the framework of the timeline of that buildup yeah. of, I'm sure there was thoughts in your mind going through this of, well, this is just what it's like to lead a church. This is just what it takes to lead a church. You just have to deal with this kind of stuff and you just have to man up because this is just what the job requires. Uh, right. But what was the time frame and 
And can you look back on that now and say, okay, well, there was, there were the yellow flags and then there was the yeah. red flags. And then, you know, I, I tell people all, you know, I read years ago that you can die quicker from a lack of sleep than you can from a lack of food, which is, <laughs> which is why they use it as a, a torture uh, tactic. But yeah. give us that framework a little bit. How, sure. how did this play out over yeah, a timeline? I, 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 I would say probably over a year, a course of a year, uh, my first year as a pastor, if I look back with now the lens that I do have, I would have seen all the signs of building anxiety that shows up in our thoughts, in the ways in which I kept ruminating and turning a thought, you know, turning worries over and over in my head. It turns up in my relationships, how I was relating to my other staff members with and, and ways in which our anxiety shows up in our relationship. And then in my body, uh, and as I said, that, that in, especially in how I was sleeping less and less. Now, the curious thing was that I kept narrating it exactly like you just said, as this is part of the job, I'm, I have a lot of workload, I have a lot of stress, I'm still adjusting. I never quite named it as I am suffering from anxiety, which is at the heart is what it was happening. And the real question then is why? Why could I not admit, why could I not name and recognize that this was anxiety? And I think this gets to the fact that the dominant uh, narrative explanation around anxiety in the Christian world uh, is really problematic, or <laughs> problematic in two ways. <laughs> yeah. It's problematic because it defines it as a problem. It defines anxiety solely as a problem to make go away. And, it, and there's really two ways we treat it as a problem. One uh, as uh, what I call pray it away as a spiritual problem that we pray it away or as a mental health problem that we prescribe away, right? We mm -hmm. pray it away or prescribe it away. So in the pray it away, uh, this is where anxiety is viewed as a lack of faith, as a lack of trust in God, as something that, you know, you just need to pray harder, memorize more scriptures, meditate more, or in some other way, get, make it go away. And I think I was really operating with that, uh, either con subconsciously or maybe in some ways even consciously, because once you think of, it, of anxiety as a sin or at least as a lack of faith, then there's a lot of shame attached to the experience of anxiety. And especially as a senior pastor, a new mm -hmm. senior pastor, wow, your new senior pastor lacks faith? Your new senior pastor yeah. you know, doesn't trust God? That's a pretty hard admission to make either to yourself and certainly to others. And so this is why I think I just kept pushing it away thinking it's something else other than this anxiety within me. Now, there are other churches that I think maybe less make more room for anxiety uh, in terms of it not being necessarily a sin, but they still treat it as a problem to make go away. And they just outsource it to secular mental health to prescribe away, hmm. either through therapy or medication. And let me be clear, in my own experience, I have benefited from therapy and from medication. I've, I've done it. And I, it's, it's helpful to bring the sort of physiological symptoms of anxiety back down to manageable levels so that you can sleep a little more and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. However, that approach of prescribing it away does not open up the doorway to spiritual transformative growth. It's just meant to treat the symptoms. That's what mm -hmm. secular mental health does with its prescribe it away. And so uh, both of those, pray it away or prescribe it away, they miss the spiritual opportunity for growth. And that's what I missed. And that's why I, I, like I said, kept just trying to push it away. And that it came back to actually, it came back in ever greater um, levels precisely because I was trying to push away something that you cannot push away. You're trying to do something that is impossible. You're trying to avoid the unavoidable when you solely engage with anxiety as a problem. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, particularly a lot of the aspects of our faith as Christians really lead us down this this uh, inadequate path of pray it away because when you say pray it away that sounds like a spiritual pathway it sounds like a spiritual solution yeah. and then uh, in in some ways you know the the most uh, familiar readings of scripture uh, seem like direct uh, imperatives from Jesus do not worry uh, fear not uh, Paul's uh, Paul's admonition to the Philippians that you reference in your book, uh, all of those seem to be very, uh, in some ways, simple and definitive. Don't do this, do that. Um, yeah. 
And obviously, and you you make much of prayer in your book uh, as a part of this, that that is a part of the spiritual Absolutely. journey yeah. we're invited into, but just simply um, uh, making it too simplistic as a pray it away, and if you have enough faith, it'll go away, uh, like we do with a number of other sins and another a number of other challenges that we face. Um, uh, it's like saying to a person who's grieving the loss of a loved one, well, if you, if you just pray deep enough, then God will comfort you and this won't be a problem for you anymore. It just, it doesn't, it did, that just doesn't, it's an inadequate answer, right? It's inadequate. It's inadequate for anybody who's tried it. <laughs> and it's an it's a inaccurate uh, reading of scripture. And so this is where I won't go into all the detail. I invite readers, listeners to get my book if they want the exegesis of key passages like Philippians 4, 6, the, you know, uh, do not be anxious uh, verse that that often is quoted. Um, but just real quick, uh, to give you some examples, uh, you know, Philippians 4, 6, you can't read that as Paul saying, do not be anxious because it's a sin. Because in Philippians 2, 28, just a couple of, you know, paragraphs before, Paul talks about how anxious he is feeling mm-hmm. about Epaphroditus not being there. He's right. he's saying, I'm anxious. Right. So it would be very strange if having just confessed how anxious he is to Philippians, he turns around and says, and by the way, anxiety is a sin. So don't you even dare think about it, you know, experiencing right. it. Um, so and then I think that the central claim that I make to folks, if they're at all mistaken in their belief that anxiety is a sin, is I say, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. In Gethsemane, all the Gospels uh, in the pathway to the cross, for Mar- Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's in the Gethsemane passage. For John, it's in John 12. But it's all when they are, they are depicting Jesus facing his ultimate trial, his ultimate loss that he is going to experience in the imminent future. All of the Gospels go out of the way to describe Jesus as having the classic human symptoms of anxiety, distress, troubled in soul, you know, <laughs> Almost sweating is almost like they're bleeding. And it's it's unable extreme. to sleep. Yeah, unable, unable to sleep. To even sleep. The, the, yes. the, oh, the disciples are sleeping, but he's not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So so clearly Jesus is experiencing anxiety. And so that should be the definitive rebuttal to any notion that anxiety is sin, but that rather anxiety is the natural human reaction to impending trial, to impending loss that we face in the future. So natural that Jesus, in taking on our full humanity, took on for himself human anxiety. So Jesus himself experienced it. So we should know we have a Lord and Savior that is deeply empathetic, that is not wagging his finger saying, just do not fear. I, you know, do not fear. It's simple. Just don't fear. It's not, you can't read scripture that way um, because it's coming, all of those encouragements and they're encouragements. They're not admonitions or con- condemnations are coming from somebody who has experience, who knows anxiety from the inside. And here's the final thing that I want to say about why we just cannot treat anxiety as something that is that we can just make go away. Because again, anxiety equals loss. This is the formula that I depict in my book. Anxiety is the natural human reaction to some impending potential loss in the future. Anxiety equals loss. So, Mark, if we are saying we can just make anxiety go away, we can just pray anxiety away, what we are saying is that we can pray loss away, that we can just make loss go away. Now, anybody who has lived knows that is just not true, that that we can just pray loss away. If If you're at all honest with your life, we all have experienced loss. No matter how much we might have prayed to avoid that loss, we've nevertheless gone through it. Because the scriptures never promise that God exists to make law loss go away. God is not some cosmic insurance broker in the sky, insuring us against all potential loss. Quite the contrary. The life of Jesus shows that the truly human life is destined for loss. This is Jesus goes to the cross, his death which is the loss of all losses for all of us. That's when we lose everything, right? So, mm-hmm. so that, that is immediately should show us that anxiety is not something that we make go away, that we try to avoid, but rather something we go through. And we go through with Jesus, holding on to Jesus with a promise, a remarkable promise on the other side of loss. But that promise, we get to that promise, which we can talk about 
not by avoiding it, not by avoiding loss, not by going around it, but only by going through loss. That's why I, I depict loss as a doorway, uh, anxiety as a doorway that we have to go through. Yeah, and I think this is really one of the key parts of where the book is so helpful in is in the the reframing both of of the terminology and understanding of both anxiety and loss, um, because so much about our lives is about that. It you know. We talk about in our organization a lot that people typically interpret change as loss. Whatever mm. the change is, there. That's right. If you announce a change uh, in some ways, right. kind of the normal human uh, knee jerk reaction is that that's going to mean a loss in some way uh, because it represents a change. And and yeah. you know, as my pastor used to say, nobody likes change, or the only one that does is a wet baby. Is <laughs> <laughs> and even they don't like the experience a lot of times of yeah, being changed. Yeah. Um, but uh, talk about that from the standpoint of uh, your definition is really fundamental to getting the message of this book, which is anxiety equals loss, or in this particular case, the the fear of future loss. Talk about That's that right. aspect of what you mean by fear, the, not the actual, the, there may be no yeah. actual loss in the way that we initially think about it when we get anxious, but this idea of the fear of a future loss and how anxiety is rooted in something that hasn't even usually happened yet. Yeah, that's right. Anxiety is like this, is this hijacker. I call this mental hijacker Mm. that hijacks us into the future where it then threatens us with some potential future loss. Um, And that's, that's true of every anxiety, right? When we feel sad, that's because something actually present is happening that we've lost. Anxiety is when we are anticipating some future loss that hasn't happened yet, but could happen. If For any of your, our listeners, if you are feeling anxious about anything, just do this exercise and see if you can name, first of all, the loss, that the underlying loss that's driving this anxiety is finances, relationships, some self-image, um, some experience that we fear losing, and that that time frame around that loss is in the future. We think it's it's possible, it's impending. And the reason why it's crucial to recognize this is because that uh, explains the second half of the anxiety formula, which is anxiety equals loss times avoidance, times avoidance. Avoidance is the multiplier effect. Hmm. We can't avoid loss, actually, because like I said, loss is built and baked into human life. We're all destined for loss. But if we somehow think that we can avoid future loss, we can do something now to avoid and and guarantee loss avoidance, that's where the multiplier effect comes in. That's when we engage into avoidance moves. And this this can happen mentally, physically, behaviorally, even spiritually. Things that we do that we engage in really with the underlying motivation of, I just want to avoid this loss. That's the most important thing. So the illustration I use for this is, is rumination. Because that's my most powerful avoidance move is when I am facing some potential loss in the future. So this happened for me when I was a pastor, right? When I was fearing the loss of our con- our congregational numbers, our congregational giving, uh, and all that. I'm, I'm afraid of some loss in the future. What I got into was rumination, which is when I'm turning a thought, I'm turning that s- scenario and situation over and over in my mind. And the motivation there is, I think, if I just turn over this, these thoughts over enough, I will make this one final turn that will reveal, aha, this is the path, this is the approach, this is the thing that guarantees I will not avoid that loss. The silver but bullet, Mark, I call it. It's yeah. the silver bullet, yeah, right? Got, it's the magic yeah. turn, final turn. Yeah, and let, me just, right. let me just interject here for a second because yeah. I heard you talk about this, the symptom of rumination uh, a number of weeks, it might be a number of months ago, on your Good Faith podcast, as as yeah. uh, you were reflecting a part of the book in a conversation that you were having, and you talked about this, and I thought, okay, somebody now understands me uh, because this is what I do. <laughs> okay, this yeah. this process of rumination um, and, and this symptom of rumination is characteristic of me, and I want to get to that. But let me let me pause for a second and make an aside, which is this is where when I hear you talking and defining anxiety in this way. Uh, it, it it draws a distinction between anxiety and what I would call simple fear. Uh, yeah. We we do have a natural God given fear instinct. Like 
if, yeah. if, if we're walking in the woods on a hike and we meet a bear, we're supposed to be afraid. Yeah, and, that's right. and that's a normal, natural reaction to a real uh, immediate physical threat. Uh, and that's normal, natural fear. That's different from anxiety, anxiety that is that is rooted in a fear of future loss and is multiplied yeah. by avoidance. Uh, so That's there's, right. you know, not all fears are the same. Um, yeah. And so we have That's to make right. that distinction, but then this symptom of rumination, uh, and, and I wonder if it's not just indicative of the way you and I react, Curtis, but is uh, perhaps very widespread of it. There's just something I'm not getting. There's, there's yeah, a thought, exactly. <laughs> there's an That's idea right. There's a secret trap door in this scenario, yeah. in this situation that I'm facing, and that is making me enormously afraid uh, yeah. about what's coming in the next hour or the next day or the next That's month. Right. And if I can just turn it over, think about it, pray about it long enough, deep enough, or get to the right person who, yeah. who has the wisdom that I need. Yeah. Then it or will say unlock, the right thing. Yeah, it will, yeah. It, will yeah. Unlo- uh, it will unlock this conundrum, and I will be That's set right. free, right? Yes, exactly. You've, you've described it exactly right. And so the way I liken it to, it becomes this thought that you're tr- like a ball that you're turning over and over, thinking one final turn, there is the solution for loss It's avoidance. the Rubik's Cube. It's what I call the, the it's anxiety a, Rubik's Cube. Or the cube. Rubik's Cube, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But because loss is ultimately unavoidable, like that 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 magical, uh, this guarantees me from any possibility of loss. That that final turn does not exist. We then keep having to turn, 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 and so it, it's like we're the ha- it's or another vision visual of it is it's the hamster wheel. We're yeah. turning it over mentally in our hamster wheel because and we can't get anywhere because we can't actually get to the place that we want to get to, which is guaranteed loss avoidance. It doesn't exist. So instead, we're turning it over and over in our heads. And um, yes, I think some people are wired more that way. I think it sounds like you and, you and I are wired more that way. Interestingly, not everybody is, is wired that way. Um, mm. Other people are more, so because this is like the turning it around and around, other people are wired to flee, to get away from a thought. So they, they engage into avoidance by not wanting to talk about that subject, by like mm. avoiding that experience or avoiding that scenario. This is where a lot of phobias come in is where people are like, ah, they can't come into contact with that feared loss. And so they flee away from any possible exposure to it. What's so interesting for me is I used to think my rumination was that I was like not fleeing o- away from my my problems and my anxiety. What I've had to realize is no, it's just kind of a more subtle, um, devious way of trying to avoid loss is I just think <laughs> I can kind of, you know, think my way out of it rather right. than mentally flee away from it. And it's it's interesting. It maps onto the fact that our, like you said, our 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 natural born nervous systems is wired by what is often called the fight or flight uh, system, which is meant for our protection. It's meant for our good when facing an immediate actual concrete threat. But when anxiety hijacks our nervous system into uh, this anxiety around some future loss, that's when we get all haywire because then that fight or flight mechanism gets translated into rumination if you're a fight person, because that's really what rumination is. It's a fight with a problem that we can never win, right? right. Yeah. So, um, and or or you flee, which is the, the people who are like, uh, you're, you know, don't don't talk to me about money. I don't want to talk about money. You know, we'll just, we'll just deny <laughs> that they the have problem anxiety exists, around right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or you know, try to run away from it as as much as possible. And it's important to recognize these are all avoidance moves, right? So this is why this is what actually ratchets up anxiety. From this is the anxiety equals loss times avoidance. This is what turns natural new normal uh anxiety that we all experience that we all will experience this is what turns natural anxiety into anxiety disorders mm. uh, this is what causes dysfunctional disorders breakdowns in our mental health on our relationships in our spiritual well-being is when we engage in these avoidance moves that ratchets up anxiety into into dysfunctional disorders yeah so so talk a little bit curtis about um, how this moves forward, uh, in us and, uh, some of the symptoms that, uh, that we can talk a little bit about the symptoms that, that you indicate how they can show up physically, how they can show up relationally, how they can show up mentally. Yeah. And, and then, uh, 
so much of what I, 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 I put so much of the uh, good direction from your book under this idea of, okay, we have to take this thing that we all experience and that sometimes becomes, as you said, a disorder and can even uh, create a scenario where we just simply can't function. But yeah. how do we how do we bring this anxiety out of the darkness and into the light? As the Bible seems to indicate in so many things, that uh, the things that are in the dark places of our lives are the things that are evil and that, and that grow bigger if we let them stay there. How do we drag this, pro- this reality? I started to say problem. How do we drag this reality <laughs> of anxiety uh, and, and the way we sometimes ruminate or deny it? How do we yeah. drag it into the light and... Talk a little bit particularly about what you mean by uh, naming what it is that is making you anxious and learning to differentiate that, um, that hey, this, this has a, a reality of its own, and it is not the full essence of who you are as a person. Yeah. yeah. So this is what I call naming. I have a whole chapter in the book about naming our anxiety which is what I didn't do as a pastor, right? I, w- I was misnaming it. I was as something as everything else other than anxiety. And why naming is so powerful, Mark, is that it is it establishes two things. It establishes differentiation and authority. And this is really what I think why the first human command that God gives in Genesis two to the human to Adam and Eve is to name the beasts. It's their way of as a human to differentiate themselves from the other animals. Right when we when we give birth to a baby, we name that baby as a way to say, "Oh, this baby is no longer part of the fused within the, the mother. It is a separate being, and that's when we give it a name." And then, and then the other thing that a naming does is it gives authority. The Bible is very clear that naming is always attached to the fact that somebody is exercising authority. This is why Jesus gave nicknames to all of his disciples, like Peter. Right, and so so we're saying, "I know you. I know who you are, and I have the authority to name you." describe, to, to name your actual reality. Well, we can practice those same uh, moves of naming, exercising differentiation and authority with our anxious mental beasts that are tormenting us in our heads, right? And you can do this. Um, and so the way I did this is I uh, described this in my book, but I started naming uh, streams of thought in my head as radio stations. I gave them actual radio stations. So I named the anxiety channel uh, K-Fear. Uh, for those of us on the West Coast, our radio stations are have, have the K uh, right. mm-hmm. designation, right? So, And so the, my ability to then was then, so when that rumination started kicking in, I would then say, oh, okay, what's happening is K-Fear is playing. Let me tune in to K-Fear. Rather than engage it, rather than like start give give myself and let me be hijacked by it, I sort of differentiated myself and just said, let me tune in. What is K-Fear saying? What songs are it playing? Right. So it was my way of being able to name. And then, then that was enabled me to recognize, oh, this is what's really going on. This is the underlying fear that I have. So there was like this recognition. And then I could differentiate myself from it. It was like, oh, that's that's a thought. That's an anxious thought. That's an anxious rumination. That's a pattern. I wasn't always able to break free from the rumination, but that was always the first steps to breaking its sort of hijacking hold over me was by naming it. And then I could exercise a little bit of increasing authority over it. Because once I could picture it as, oh, this is not me. I'm not, I am not fused with my anxious thoughts. I am different from my thoughts in some way such that I can observe it. And then I can start exercising some some authority over it. I could I could maybe sometimes even change the channel. Like I'm going to think about something else now, um, or I distract myself with with an actual radio station, like a baseball game or something like that. So I could actually differentiate, or I could start turning the volume down. Like if I couldn't change the channel and the, the thoughts just kept ruminating, I could be like you know what I'm going to just turn the volume down a little bit on that. Hmm. Um, it takes practice and it takes work and it takes the spiritual assistance of the Holy Spirit. To, to exercise that differentiation and authority. But we have that God-given um, power to name that is really intrinsic to us as, as bearers of God's image. Um, and we can exercise that with our anxious thoughts as well. Curtis, I, I imagine as somebody might be listening to us, if, uh, and, and particularly maybe tr- depending upon what part of the Christian tradition they would be coming from or a part of, uh, would you go down the road just a little bit around the idea of, okay, it's 
it's uh, it's Satan or the devil suggesting uh, these things to me, or in some way implanting them in my mind. How, in in terms of um, the spiritual realities between good and evil, uh, you talked in just a moment ago about the Holy Spirit teaching us and encouraging us to say, "Hey, this is this is not my identity. This is not simply I'm a a weak, pitiful Christian." And I just can't trust God like I'm supposed to, and that's why I'm having these uh, thoughts. The differentiation and authority really helps us to start getting a framework around that. But how would how would you say if somebody said, "Well, that's just the devil trying to get in my head"? Is is yeah. that the best way? Is that a it's, good way to possible. say it? Possible. I I think I would be careful about over jumping to that interpretation. I wouldn't rule it out either. So I think these are things are that this is why again I write my book about how do we cultivate our ability to hear the the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in our anxiety. Because actually anxiety is a great opportunity for us to develop our sort of vocal, rec- our, our spiritual vocal recognition skills of what yes. is, what this voice, what this thought is, is it coming from God? Is it coming from myself and my fear? Is it coming from uh, the evil one? So, I mean, I think those are all possibilities. So I won't, I, I don't feel like it's my place to prescribe a, you know, cookie cutter, one size fits all interpretation for everyone. I think it's going to differ in different situations. I would say it's most important, I think, to learn to tune into um, and recognize um, not so much like, is this from, you know, what is the ultimate spiritual origin, but to recognize the nature of it. Like, what is the, what is, what is the loss that's really happening? I mean, it may be coming from you and your childhood experiences. It may be coming from the, from the active presence of the same. It's, it's less important we name it than more that we recognize, hey, what is, the, what is my underlying feared loss here? And then how do I actually think about and respond to that loss in Jesus, right? Like we should be paying more attention to Jesus than we do our, to the to Satan, even if it is from Satan. The, the, our response to 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 a voice from Satan isn't so much, oh, let me really clearly identify this is Satan. It's more like, well, let me turn my attention to Jesus. What is what does he have to say about this fear loss? And this is where we have to be really, really um, uh, kind of well read or or be paying attention to Jesus' words in scripture. Because I think one of the temptations is to project onto Jesus the answer that we think he should give. Hmm. Uh, but Christians do this all the time, right? Like this is where even, you know, in some spiritual traditions that, and I value spiritual traditions that are like that hear a word of knowledge or hear from God directly. But yet those traditions are also very vulnerable to where people project onto that experience, something that they want God to say, not what God is actually saying. And we have to recognize we have this very strong impulse in us to avoid loss. And so Mm. we want to hear from God some word that says, oh, it's okay. You will not experience that loss. But if you actually read scripture and read especially Jesus as the model of human life, we have to be really careful about claiming that God promises loss avoidance because that is just not true in scripture, there's never any blanket promise that says, well, yeah, to my followers, you will never experience trials. You will never experience loss. Quite the contrary. We are actually promised we will experience trials. We will experience loss. And therefore, the ultimate Jesus answer to loss has to be something other than you will avoid it in your life. And, and maybe that's where we want to go next, Mark. I don't know. I'll let you guide yeah, no, the train here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I think so. But it just, it just makes me think that this, this tremendous uh, passion that we have to avoid loss uh, in, in what you're describing right now, if you take it to a far enough extreme, you start warping the gospel into something that that's we right. might call the prosperity gospel. Um, that's that, right that is a departure and a twisting of what biblical uh, teaching is really all about. That if, if you do have enough faith, if you just trust God enough, you will not experience any loss. Well, that's, that's prosperity gospel by definition. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, and that could sneak in in all sorts yeah. of ways, right? Without being the full blown version of that. I tell the story in my book, you know, I have chronic back pain. And when I was in college, we, the, the my Christian fellowship in school, mobilized this prayer time for me that got built up with all this expectation and all of this sort of uh, belief that God was going to heal me. And we had brought in this charismatic uh, healing 
you know, pr- a preacher that was, you know, had the healing gifts uh, attached to his name and you know, all of this. And then like, it didn't happen. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't healed from no. that. And, and the, that experience, it was a real ch- spiritual challenge for me. Like I had, it really messed me up and I, and I had to really figure out how to make sense of it. And I ultimately had to realize, wow, I think we were all anxious I was anxious. My friends were anxious for me and so forth. And we ended up projecting onto God our anxieties. And, mm. and, and the way we did that was like, oh, yeah, God's going to definitely make this loss go, you know, go away. And Mark, I still suffer from chronic back pain like to this, at this very moment. So that right. has not gone away. <laughs> um, and I've had to instead actually endure it, experience it, go through it, just like we have to endure, experience, go through our anxiety. Yeah. So let's, before we go a little bit further in conversation, I want you to, Take a moment, if you could, and just talk about how, whether it's in our journey with anxiety or our journey with other trials, which um, I, I think all of them have some element of anxiety attached to them. Yeah. But, you know, again, I, I keep going back to what my, some of the things that my pastor instilled in me early on. You know, I can remember him preaching very clearly from Psalm 23 that, you know, one thing you learn out of Psalm 23 is, is God doesn't ever promise you a route around the valley of the shadow of death. He promised yes, you, that's right. he promises you a pathway through it with him. Um, that's right. But, that's right. but when I, when I would hear those things and, and when I hear you talking about anxiety, it's like, uh, look, it's unavoidable and loss is unavoidable. I just, I got to tell you my reaction to that is I just don't like it, you know? And, <laughs> I know, I and know. when I, when I hear other <laughs> biblical teachers, when I hear Dr. Dennison talk about, uh, you know what, they there's just certain things in this broken world with our broken lives and all the broken lives around us. There are certain things that are unavoidable and we have to come to terms with that. And I just don't like it. I just don't like the conversation. Um, No, I think that's right. That's right. It's very honest and genuine. So, so help me come, help me come to terms, help our listeners come to terms with that in some way as uh, perhaps a necessary step of, okay, I, I now, this is part of the game. I have to now ask and, and accept God's invitation into the journey through this valley called anxiety. Yeah. Where did that it's come? Great... Where did that come for you? Um, because what, if I'm framing this, Curtis, I'm sitting here going, okay, well, the crisis of what happened to you while it was, while you were a pastor created the the immediate necessity of some interventions such as medication, uh, counseling, yeah. those types of things, just to kind of get uh, the immediate crisis of symptoms under control. But then it, it catalyzed a larger journey that has resulted in this book. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the coming to terms with all of that. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think in my catastrophic breakdown as a pastor or in like the my my back chronic back pain when i was a college student after i sort of like you said was able to get some basic equilibrium i realized the fundamental question was really and I, this is going to sound macabre but it is true was death was death because i felt like i was like i said i was dying i was being tortured to death in that you know sort of insomnia and with my back, I just felt like my body was breaking down. And I realized, wait a minute, in the end, we are all headed for that loss of all losses. Every yeah. single one of us, that's, that's unavoidable. Even, we may not like it, and I don't like it any more than you like it, Mark, but it's unavoidable. We are headed for loss, for death. So the question has got to be not how do I avoid loss? Um, and even all of our efforts to postpone it are just that. They're just postponing it a little bit further, right? Right. Um, it's not ultimate uh, loss avoidance. Um, I had to then realize, wait, what then really the a real answer to anxiety, if anxiety equals loss, um, and it's not avoidance, it's not the right way, then the real answer to anxiety for a Christian is what is the answer to death? What is the answer to the loss of all losses? And that's when I sort of finally had to dive more deeply into, wait a minute, the Christian gospel, Jesus-centered, cross-centric answer to death is not avoidance. It is not avoidance. It is resurrection. Mm. 
Right. And resurrection yeah. and avoidance are two totally different things. Resurrection only happens when you go through death, when you go through loss. It's what is on the other side of that loss. It's not avoiding it. It's not postponing it. It's not running away from it. It is on the other side of loss. And resurrection is the restoration of all loss, of our bodies, of our relationships, of things we treasure and value in the world. That is, it's, it's returning to us in, in glorified, imperishable form, in a form that we cannot lose evermore in the future. That's what resurrection is, <clears throat> is when all of those things are restored to us. And that's when I suddenly clicked for me. It's like, oh, resurrection is the actual heart of the Christian response to anxiety. That's what that's the linkage we have to connect is resurrection to anxiety. Because again, that's the only true answer to loss. And so uh the invitation the my book is ultimately leading Christians to go through their anxiety, knowing that in the middle of their anxiety, they are held by Jesus in that in that very moment. <clears throat> but it's like Jesus is holding us in the moment of anxiety, but also leading us to keep going forward through that doorway because ultimately on the other side of that doorway is resurrection our best selves our glorified self <clears throat> and so when we can when we can get um not hijacked by anxiety into our into its fear loss but actually held by Jesus uh into the future resurrection that's when like the most profound spiritual growth happens for us because then we are being present with Jesus in the moment of our anxiety, and we are placing our hope in the future for our Jesus uh, destiny, which is our resurrected selves. Yeah, which is the the great hope of the book, really, and because it's the great hope of the gospel. And and the uniqueness of the Christian gospel is this idea of resurrection through through pain, through loss, through anxiety. Is uh, that ultimately that is the that is God redeeming all things and making all things new, as you said. Uh, and, and in that journey, uh, some some real uh, practical steps, obviously uh, naming and authority being a part of that. But one of the things I wanted to, to touch on here uh, as a part of the learning of resurrection experience, you know, as in, in recent years, God has really brought me into uh, an ongoing conversation with him about what Paul says in the Philippian letter as well, where he says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. And I want yes, there to be a yes. period right there, but the rest <laughs> of the sentence is, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Gotcha. And it's, That's and it's right. like, these two things are coupled. I'm like, I'll take the first part. I don't really want the second part. I'm going to avoid <laughs> that. Um, but, but Paul also says in this letter, you know, I, that he has uh, we would say willingly and by faith suffered the loss of all things that mm -hmm. he had had counted as valuable and important to him because he he had learned the greater value of Christ and that in some ways all of these other things were getting in the way of him getting to a true and personal relationship and depth with Christ. Um, but but one thing we we really do experience because of technology and social media, a lack of simply being present. And talk about that part of your book for a moment about what it means to learn the, the resurrection reality of being present with God. Dr. Dennison likes to say to us around here at Dennison Forum, you know, we need to remember regularly that all there is of God is in this moment. Yeah. And how does that address this uh, phenomenon, the formula of anxiety being rooted in the law in a future loss, the fear of yeah. a future loss. Talk about presence as a learned skill. Yeah, I love that uh, that verse that you've quoted in Philippians: the fellowship of his suffering. Right, the mm. fellowship of his sufferings. Um, so, how do we have that? How do we? How do we grow in that fellowship of his suffering as a way we respond to anxiety? So one way that I try to summarize this is to say, with the resurrection, we have a different formula. If the formula that we're trapped in when we are trapped in anxiety disorder is anxiety equals loss times avoidance, then the resurrection formula is <clears throat> anxiety equals loss divided by holding. 
divided by holding. And you can almost visually picture loss <clears throat> as the numerator and holding as the de uh, denominator, as the figure below, right? Mm. It's like holding, how do we hold that loss uh, and bear its weight uh, on top of us? And I think resurrection, uh, we, can, we can hold our resurrection promise in, in a number of different ways. Well, one, of course, is in, in prayer and in fellowship with Jesus in prayer, that we allow him to hold us and comfort us in the, as we are suffering that loss, as we're going through it, and then also hold on to the resurrection promise to, so that we can endure this loss knowing this loss is not the final word. This loss is not final. There comes a day when Jesus returns to this earth to bring to resurrect all who have died and to restore all the losses we've experienced, there, that, so that that loss we can hold it, knowing it's not final, right? So there's a way in which we are we have fellowship with Jesus, such that that holding capacity can bear the weight of loss as the numerator, as the figure on top of us. Hmm. But but Paul, when he talks about fellowship, always talks about fellowship not just in an individual one on one with Jesus in this privatized fashion. Fellowship for him is always koinonia, right? It is always about fellowship with others as well. Yes. And we see in Paul that the fellowship of sufferings is both with Jesus, but also with others. And this is why community is so, so important to anxiety, because anxiety isolates us, especially when we believe that it is a sin or a lack of faith, and we have an extra layer of shame on top of that anxiety, then we really get isolated. It's why I couldn't admit as a pastor to anybody else mm. that I was deeply, deeply anxious, right? And so we withdraw as individuals, and we were just never meant to hold loss by ourselves. It is not good for any human being to be alone. Right? Which, is, first, which is, again, modeled by your, your earlier reference to Gethsemane, right? He, he could have gone to Gethsemane by himself. But totally. He could have left them in the upper room. He could have walked down the Kidron Valley and into Gethsemane all by himself. But he chose to take the 12, and then he chose to take three even further into the garden That's with right. him. And he's frustrated when he comes back, and they're not able to, to hold be, it with him, right? To hold yeah, him yeah. and to hold yeah. with him in this that's experience, right. right? Yes. I mean, like, that's think about that for a moment. That's that like Jesus, in, as he faced his loss, what did he most want? Well, certainly to be held by the Father. That's why he was in prayer. But then he wanted to be held by his closest friends. Mm. That, again, is, is exactly right, is the most profound declaration that we were not meant to go through our losses and not meant to experience our ang related anxieties by ourselves. We're meant to be held by others. And this is the great challenge because the flesh part of ourselves wants to withdraw, wants to be isolated, doesn't want to be held by others in the moment of anxiety. You know, that key, that, that, that key phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, that gets used for a lot of different contexts. Mm. That was used in Gethsemane precisely when Jesus was diagnosing the, the inability of his friends to hold him in his anxiety, right? Mm. So that the idea that, yeah, there's willingness, but the flesh is weak. And this is true, I think, in Christian circles, that we have, uh, we have the possibility of holding each other in our losses, in our anxiety, because we meet in communities. We meet in small groups, in Bible studies, in prayer groups, in men's accountability groups, uh, and so forth. That potential is there. And I think the spiritual willingness there, but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. Like we as human beings do not, are not very good at holding each other in our anxiety. And there's all sorts of ways in which our fleshliness gets weak. We can avoid it. It makes us uncomfortable. We can not be uh, nervous because we don't know what to do when somebody tells and shares about their anxiety or their loss. It can make right. us uncomfortable. Uh, we can get we, there, people's anxieties. Other people's anxiety can make us anxious. Mm. And so one thing that I know I do, that's my fleshly weakness, is I want to solve their problem for them. As This is especially true in my parenting. Mm -hmm. I want to just like solve their problem for them because they're making me anxious. My kids are making me anxious with their problem. I want to solve their problem so that I don't feel anxious. Right. right. Yeah. That's really, it's really what's going on for me. Yeah. If you and, can, and if you can solve all... it, if you can solve it for them, you can solve it for all of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Time, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, right. But what I, what I tell people is, and this is where vulnerability is just a, a learned necessity for us as believers yeah. and, 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 and pursuing safe environments with people 
where we can learn to do this at increasingly deeper, deeper levels. But it's also something I have learned to do in some of my own journeys of anxiety is to be counterintuitive because mm. when, when we're hurting or when we're fearing a potential hurt, we, we have what I call the turtle effect. We want to withdraw into yes, our shell. That's right. And that's, that's right. initially, in a, initially there's something probably good and healthy about that, but we tend to stay in the shell too long. That's right. uh, I remember I had a, a lady in my church one time and her and her family had gone through a horrific, terrible situation and she withdrew into her shell and didn't come to church, didn't come to community. And, and I remember there was this one friend of hers who, after waiting a long number of weeks, finally just went and had a cup of coffee in her hand, knocked on her door and said, I'm coming after you. And, yeah. and, and she was like, you know what? I, I need you to do that because I don't think I've got the, I don't have the gumption to, to open this door on my own yeah. and step out. Yeah. I need you to step in so I can eventually step out. And, and if we can help Christians sometimes realize you have to think with the Holy Spirit's help counterintuitive um, to step out and to let yourself be vulnerable and to let yourself be confessional. And I've even seen people do this in group settings where they just say, I don't need you to fix this. If there was an easy fix, it, I would have already found it. I would have found Yeah, that's right. I would have found it but, already. <laughs> but, we, you know, we talked about bringing things into the light. When, when you're willing to step into an environment with other believers and to share your anxiety, you're actually bringing it into the light where, right. where the shared light of that community can hold it with you because there are some things that are just too overwhelmingly big for you to be able to hold, including your anxiety. But then you also... You talk about not only being held by the Father through things like prayer and scripture and then also community, but I want to touch on this last one before we run out of time, which is the idea of grief, um, yeah. the idea of, of holding uh, our, some of our anxiety and our fear of loss in this, this big bucket called grief or what I've now started to get somewhat more comfortable with is the terminology of lament. Can you mm. unpack that a yeah. little bit while we have a few minutes left? Sure. So I think this is where, as is also a part of the whole community piece that we we're talking about, is how do we grieve together? Because what grieving is, is simply saying, rather than running away from it emotionally or in other ways from the experience of loss, I'm going to actually experience it. I'm going to experience it. And then not experience it alone, but even experience it with others where we grieve together. That's what grieving is. It's, like, it's, it's recognizing, naming, actually experiencing the pain of a loss. And when we do that, it builds our holding capacity. We can hold, we find out we can hold loss because once we're willing to actually experience it and feel it with others, we realize, wait a minute, oh, that, that, was, that, was, that was hard, that was painful, but I could do it. I, I made it through. I could actually experience it. I didn't, I don't, this is not something I have to run away from. Mm. I have to avoid. And so that's why grieving builds our capacity to hold. Now, the key, again, is that we're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to grieve with others. And that, again, is, is hard because of exactly like you said, the turtling impulse for us is to not share our grief, not share our losses with others. And so this is a great invitation for us and why anxiety is an opportunity. Because when you are experiencing anxiety, it means you are you know, fearing some impending loss and the ability to bring that to others, with others, and be able to, if that loss happens, to actually go through it, experience it, grieve it, and then recognize, oh, we were able to be held, held ultimately by our Father, and then by secondarily by each other. That builds our confidence and our capacity to face other future losses in the future because we have a track record now to look back on and say, I went through that. I grieved, but I made it through. And that's really, I think, how we grow. One of the key ways we grow spiritually, Mark. Yeah. And I think, you know, and that's, that's where God has kind of uh, maybe, I might say, expanded my understanding of grief in all that you said, but also in this idea of lamenting, uh, which is the idea of holding something that simply cannot be fixed until resurrection, yeah. that's right. until resurrection redeems it. Yeah. Um, lamenting is just giving voice to our grief. That's right. lamenting and grief. I equate very similarly. And the I think that the invitation for us is to really develop shared ways of lamenting so that it's not just a privatized experience. This is a lot of reasons why I wrote the book, Mark, was just to give a, give a resource so that, uh, I, that 
people, and I hope some, I hope, I certainly hope individuals will read this book, but I also hope groups mm, will yes. use this book in, in a book study, in a Bible study, a small group or whatever. Because uh, I, it's a way, and I, sh- I wrote the book with a lot of my own personal experiences embedded in this book because I want to model for people this is how you actually share with others your anxiety and your loss. And that in reading the book together, that people can can actually have a model and have something to respond to that then structures their own community experience, their own community conversation about talking about their own versions of anxiety and loss. Right. And really, really, I think, uh, give some really good handles and and steps and practices for living out what you know, we, we hear this phrase used sometimes. Um, I, I think you and David French may have had a conversation where this, this, this uh, maxim was used, which is, you know, a joy shared is a joy doubled mm. and a grief shared is a grief halved. Uh, your right. book really actually gives some very real uh, plans and practices for where that can actually come true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, uh, if we if we are really called to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep, we have to learn how to do that. We don't just automatically do that. Uh, in fact, we do the opposite, right? <laughs> and that's right. And and that's why we're suffering as a culture so much anxiety uh, and so much uh, disorder uh, around extreme versions of anxiety. Curtis, thank you for the book. Thank you, thank you for the hard hard work of putting this together and opening up your own life to share out of your own experience. And thanks for the conversation today. It's been so, so enriching. Mark, it's always so much fun to come in and talk with you. And so it's a privilege to talk about the book with you and with your listeners. So it's my pleasure. All right. Well, the book is by Curtis Chang, The Anxiety Opportunity, How Worry is the Doorway to Your Best Self. We didn't get a chance to have time to talk about this, but you can also find out more about Curtis's work at redeemingbabble.com or .org. Which one is it, Curtis? .org. Yeah, .org. Yeah. Yeah, redeeming. And join join the conversation with us on the Good Faith Podcast. Uh, Absolutely. One of the the best podcasts we can recommend to you for sure. And uh, we hope- Thanks, Mark. Likewise uh, as well. Good Faith Podcast, as well as the Denison Forum Podcast. You can find those on all of your podcast providers. And both with uh, Curtis's and with our podcast, we'd encourage you to rate, review us, share it uh, with others so that they can be assisted by these conversations. And uh, Curtis, we look forward to the next time we get to talk. And again, thank you for this good work. And thanks to our audience for listening to us today. You've been a part of the Denison Forum podcast. God bless you.